the Air Force had to have reactors. <laughs> very, very radical nuclear reactors, totally different than the kind of stuff we have now, based on the idea that you could take salts and that they would be a really good medium in which to have a nuclear reaction. Well, we were young chemical engineers at the time. God smiles on young chemical engineers. They do things that in later years would be regarded as crazy. It wasn't that I'd suddenly become converted to a belief in nuclear airplanes. That the purpose was unattainable, if not foolish, was not so important. <laughs> a high temperature reactor could be useful for other purposes, even if it never propelled an airplane. This is an old facility. Look down before you walk. That's our biggest hazard here right now. Oh. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've modeled this shape neutronically. It is oh. like a lead pencil, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Basically. We just returned from a trip to Oak Ridge National Laboratories and one of the exciting things that the Baroness and I got to do was to tour the molten salt reactor experiment which was uh, one of these type of reactors that was built in the 1960s. It was an experiment that demonstrated many of the key technologies although there are some that still remain to be demonstrated. How long have you been here? I've been here since 1992. There are very few people in mid-career in nuclear energy right now because yeah. there's a huge trough. We have a large number of students coming back into yeah. it. Well, the context has changed completely, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, when we went into nuclear energy, they said, what are you, nuts? <laughs> <laughs> there's no future in that. And it really didn't matter. We, we say it's the true believers. So you could have a molten salt reactor that you could walk around on. Oh, this is so cool. You guys have got to try this. Oh, goodness, that makes you feel really weird. <laughs> There's something in front of me here, it feels like. I was in seventh grade. I read an Isaac Asimov story about the implications of what free energy would do. And I sort of knew I wanted something. I was going to be an engineer or scientist just from day one. And this sort of said, OK, what can you do to make a difference? And that was where I, I sort of said advanced nuclear power was something that could make a difference, and that low cost clean energy could make a, a huge difference to society. If I'm going to have to get up every day for 50 or 60 years and working on something, well, it ought to be something I believe in. Liquid salts are an outstanding heat transfer media. and It really doesn't matter what you're going to be transferring heat for, whether this be a solar power tower, whether this be a salt-cooled reactor, a molten salt reactor. Viscosity on it is 30 times larger, but water is very low viscosity, so it's still a very low viscosity fluid. Some people might imagine this is quite a gloopy or kind of slow-moving liquid, but it's actually quite fluid. It's, you're right. It does go through a melt much like a glass as opposed to water, which doesn't quite do that. So we want to run it 100 C or so above this, so it does flow nicely. If you go ahead and you, do, and you repeat doing things in here, you can see you start to etch the glass just a little bit. So what we have to do in a reactor is keep things very highly reducing. If you put extra beryllium in there, essentially giving you a preferred spot to rust. And it, so this is all about controlling the potential corrosion of the salts within, its, it, within any vessel that you put it in. Yep, the iron in some of the, the alloys is more soluble at higher temperatures, and so you will get your heat exchanger where it's at hot temperatures, you will get metals taken out of solution, and then it gets to the colder end, it'll redeposit, and so you can self-plug your heat exchangers, uh, it, which you would very much like not to do, and your, your technique to avoid that is keep everything very well reduced so it doesn't corrode in the first place. You'll make it lousy, but there are no strong chemical reactions that are going to take place between the salt and even direct contact with water. The hazards on this, the same thing as hazards on a deep fat fryer, which is I like trip throwing hot oil or hot salt in this case on visitors would be considered a bad thing. But there's nothing else to this, it just makes a nice little clear liquid. But I'll just pour this out into a little stainless steel crucible and you could hear that little snap there was just there was a little bit of moisture at the bottom of the stainless steel. I mean at 450 I mean this thing is a solid so it doesn't take very long for it to form the solid again. Isn't that a nice feature? <laughs> if you had a little crack on this and it was sort of it was starting to weep it forms a plug. Self-plugging. Self-plug. That's a nice thing, not being hand, under pressure. On the other hand, if your design keeps the vessel hot, it'll stay liquid on there, but that's why you have a guard vessel. If, you know, absolute worst case happens and you have massive vessel rupture, well, you still catch it. The Navy program 
uh, that led to the light water reactors we have now was well optimized to the needs of the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually wasn't very well optimized to the needs of power production. The reason we have that as the base for our power reactor technology today is because the Navy was prepared to pay the first mover costs to make one work. And once you've done that, it's extraordinarily difficult to compete with it because those first mover costs are very, very high and have no financial return associated with them. The Navy has built their nuclear submarines and the Army has taken the same technology as the Navy, the water-cooled reactor, and they're doing their thing. But the Air Force wants to build a nuclear-powered bomber. Now Weinberg was a practical man and he said, huh, nuclear-powered bomber. That is like probably a really, really, really dumb idea. <laughs> you know. Dirty little secret was that most of the people involved in it knew from the get-go that it really wasn't practical. <laughs> um, in contrast to a submarine where you've got limited space, but you can shield it for the people on the submarine, it's much harder on an airplane because of the weight. Most of us did not really think that the aircraft reactor really could work. But we did feel that there is a very interesting technology there that someday could be applied. And I would maintain that Weinberg was absolutely right in his assessment of the situation back then. He knew that to make the nuclear airplane work, they couldn't use water-cooled reactors. They couldn't use high-pressure reactors. They couldn't use complicated solid fuel reactors. They had to have something that was so slick, that was so safe, that was so simple, they operate at low pressure, high temperatures, had all the features you wanted in it. They didn't even know what it was. I think someday this will be looked at as one of the great pivot points of history. That if this program, this nuclear airplane program, had not been established, the molten salt reactor would have never been invented. Because it is simply too radical, too different, too completely out of the ball field of everything else for it to be arrived at through an evolutionary development. It had to be forced into existence by requirements that were so difficult to achieve, and the nuclear airplane was that. So they began working on this high temperature reactor. And remember, this was invented before we had ICBMs or anything like this. This was a doomsday weapon. I mean, this was like, if you're flying this thing to Russia, it's the end of the world. I suppose you'd have to say that it was a miracle that the homogeneous reactors operated at all rather than that they operated well. Chemical stability of the system was not really sufficient. Mm -hmm. It was chemically unstable. Uh, the second reactor actually operated very well. That was the molten salt reactor experiment. There it is. This is the place. These things right over here are the spent probes. Those things would extend to like 60 foot in length. They went down the tank, did the melting, did this bubbling and stirring and everything. A lot of them, they stored above the high bay. When you say high bay... It's taller and we can put cranes in because we can lift things up. You had to go down an additional 25 to get to the top of the tanks. Then it actually you had to go inside the tanks. So those things would extend. So you got a pipe within a pipe. The box is the top part of the probe. We had the controls, we could tell exactly how far down the probe was moving and, and the weight of it and the probe had heaters on the end of it then it would melt a pool in that salt and would sink down in it. So all those long handled tools they had for operations those were it was almost heroic actions you'd say when they were trying to do things and you've got this long, length of distance and we'd certainly try to design things today that could be robotically handled it just would not be designed the same way as it was at that point. One of the things that I've learned from talking to some of the old timers at Oak Ridge, I mean these guys are in their 80s now, if they're even alive, people didn't disbelieve that we could build the machine, they didn't believe that we could maintain it. Operation of the MSRE was not too difficult and the people that I had working for me, they all had pound dogs under the porch, old cars out in the yard <laughs> that didn't run very well. If anything came up, side of the motor salt reactor. Say, hey, we fix that. How you gonna do it? I don't know, but we'll fix it. And they did. One time it sample capsule is down in the pump. Flexible steel cable got tangled up. It got bad news. Here's the end of that cable cut off. So I said, what are we going to do? And there's a good old boys for you. They said, is there such a thing as fiber optics? 
There's the capsule. And they fished that capsule out. We were back in business. And they had a lot of long-handled tools, remote cameras. And it was challenging. But he felt like, despite the challenge of operating high radiation fields, that they were able to operate and maintain that machine over the, over the course of its uh, lifetime. We worked for several years on an experiment that proved that you can handle this molten salt reliably, and when things go wrong, we were able to fix. The advantages outweigh the difficulties, and the concept is ultimately going to be a practical application. We still have a few folks who are even operators here who are around. Sid Ball's office is just literally three over from me. He was at the controls when it reached its highest power uh, uh, there. He told me that was an accident. It sure was. <laughs> yeah. There's another way to tell that story, too. <laughs> I was running some tests late at night. The device that I was using uh, got stuck in the wrong place and pulled the rod out, and the power went, went up and up beyond the design power and then controlled itself and went back down. Wow. Everybody was happy. I started out uh, at the lab in 1957 and got onto the molten salt reactor project, the MSRE, Molten Salt Reactor Experiment, uh, mainly in the instrumentation and controls aspects of it. Uh, but I quickly got into the uh, dynamic analysis, uh, which was uh, a, a lot of fun for that reactor because it's uh, an inherently safe reactor. Uh, the dynamics were, uh, let's say, not uh, common to uh, reactors because it uh, was molten salt instead of uh, water-cooled uh, solid fuel. You could change the load on this radiator by moving the doors down and the reactor would follow the load. I migrated to the MSR program doing the nuclear and mechanical analysis of the performance of the reactor. Often folks are afraid that a reactor can run away on them, that, it, that a reactor is somehow a, an inherently unstable system that people have to always be keeping their eye on lest it get away. Certain designs 